looks like people are joining us, so that's perfect. Excellent. There we go. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us on Wednesday evening for a uh, return to innovations in equine asthma. Uh, this webinar was so popular back in August that we decided to have Dr. Sarah Roos back for a part two. So we're glad that you guys are all here to learn some more um, and hopefully you brought some questions. So um, Sarah Roos, VMD, DACVIM, serves as an equine technical manager with Boehringer Ingelheim Animal Health. After attending Pennsylvania State University for her undergraduate degree, she then obtained her VMD from the University of Pennsylvania. After an internship at Equine Medical Center of Ocala, she next completed a large animal internal medicine residency at Texas A&M University. Dr. Roos then practiced general and specialty medicine at McKinley and Peters Equine Hospital in Spokane, Washington. Pursuing her love of teaching, she joined the faculty at the University of Florida's College of Veterinary Medicine in 2010, serving as a clinical assistant professor and chief of the Large Animal Medicine Service. Dr. Roos transitioned to industry in 2016, first with Muriel, who was then acquired by Boehringer Engelheim. Her professional interests include gastrointestinal disease, neurology, endocrine disease, respiratory disease, and infectious diseases of the horse and foal. She's also active in organized veterinary medicine, currently serving on the AAEP Board of Directors, in addition to roles in the ACVIM, AVMA, and the Veterinary Leadership Institute. In her free time, Dr. Bruce enjoys traveling, running, kayaking, hiking, and riding her Dutch Wormblet mare. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Roos. Take it away. Excellent. Thank you for having me. I feel like I need to update my bio since, you know, travel is not really a portion of my life currently or anyone's lives, uh, but the rest uh, certainly still holds true. And I think I said this on the last time I did this. I do currently own a warm blood. I did the thing you're never supposed to do as a veterinarian, which is that I took a patient home, um, but I freely admit that the off-the-track thoroughbred is actually my first love, hence why I love doing stuff here with the Retired Race Force Project. So thank you for those of you who are joining us again. Um, hopefully many of you were here uh, when we did our asthma review before. I will briefly review a couple of things we talked about there. So if you weren't on the last asthma webinar, just to make sure that we're kind of all on the same page in terms of what asthma is and why horses get it. But really this particular webinar, we're gonna spend a lot more time talking about treatment. Um, so a little bit about the environment, but really focusing on drugs because happily we have a new drug to introduce you to. Um, and I had to put this picture in um, for two reasons. One, my disclosure. So I do work for Berner Engelheim. Uh, we make a servo equihaler, which is the product we're gonna talk about. We also make Venti Pullman. Um, so when we're talking about equine asthma, I have to talk about those two things. Um, but this is actually from RP, I guess it would have been 2019. Um, and look forward to driving my little golf cart around the horse park again in 2021. So like I said, we'll do a brief review before we get into treatment. So if you weren't here for our last one, you won't be totally lost. You know, I think the first thing to talk about is just the terminology itself, which is equine asthma. Um, you know, I think for some people, this is still kind of a new term, you know, not that you're unfamiliar with the term asthma, but in terms of referring to it within horses, you know, it is a disease that has been known for centuries. Um, it was actually even first described by Aristotle in 300 BC um, and described as broken wind. Um, I think heaves is a quite popular term for it, especially amongst horse owners. You know, there was a period we went through where we were calling it COPD, but we've really tried to erase that from the veterinary vocabulary just because COPD in people is very different than, than what we're talking about here in horses. You know, then we spent probably about the last 10 to 15 years talking a lot about RAO or recurrent airway obstruction and IAD or inflammatory airway disease as kind of the, the two subsets of this disease. But then starting in 2016, we said, let's just call it equine asthma. That's, you know, people are familiar with the term asthma since people get asthma. Um, so many of you probably, if, if you haven't experienced it in your horse, you may have experienced it yourself or with a family member or child. Um, so just trying to make it terminology that's just more readily accessible to everyone. But we do still have to kind of distinguish between two clinical severities of asthma. So we talk about mild to moderate asthma, which is really what we used to be referring to as, as infl inflammatory airway disease. And that is a disease that we see in young to middle-aged horses, um, can also see it in older, but in general, it's, it's young to middle-aged. 
And it really is associated with exercise. So these are horses that at rest may look totally normal, but you ask them to do anything and they develop a cough or they have you know, some poor performance or some exercise intolerance. The mild to moderate asthma cases can you know, happen and get better uh, with treatment or sometimes even without treatment, just with management changes. Horses can essentially kind of, for lack of a better term, outgrow mild to moderate asthma and may go on to a perfectly normal life. You know, when we talk about numbers, um, there was a study that came out that, you know, specific to, to thoroughbred racehorses showed that upwards of 80% of thoroughbred racehorses might have some degree of mild to moderate asthma. Now, some of that is probably that we're diagnosing it while they're actively racing because they need their lungs so much to, to do their job. Um, fortunately, you know, having mild to moderate asthma when they are a young horse and in that, you know, training and race portion of their life doesn't mean that all of them will go on to developing severe asthma. Um, but we do know that horses with severe asthma usually did go through a period as a younger animal where they had mild to moderate. So, you know, especially if, if some of you are kind of really currently in that transition period from, you know, getting the horses off the track and getting them into their next jobs, you know, it certainly is something to be aware of. Because severe asthma, or what we used to refer to as RAO, you know, it was generally thought of in, in slightly older horses, although it has even been documented in some four and five-year-olds, but usually it's seven years of age and up. And these are horses that, while they certainly have issues with exercise, they also now have issues at rest. Um, so this is the horse that even just, you know, stand around the stall or uh, stand around his paddock, might have a cough, might have what we call dyspnea, so increased uh, respiratory rate and effort. And the, the worst part, so to speak, about severe asthma is that A, it is recurrent, hence why we used to call it recurrent airway obstruction. So horses, it, clinical signs may kind of wax and wane, um, but unfortunately it is progressive. And more and more we are finding uh, data that show that we have what's called remodeling of the lungs. So again, for lack of a better term, they, they start to scar. Um, so as horses go through more and more cycles of having asthma, uh, they get harder and harder for us to control. And so that just becomes important for two reasons. One, the sooner we can break the process, the better. And two, if we're trying to treat a horse that has severe equine asthma, we just need to kind of match our expectations to how bad that horse has been because we recognize that we may have some of that remodeling that's not gonna be quick or easy to change. So what happens with equine asthma? So really it's, it's airway hyper-responsiveness. So something about you know, the combination of that horse and his environment, he inhales something that triggers this hyper-responsive um, issue within the lungs. The primary thing that happens is inflammation. Um, so we get white blood cells that come into the lung tissue itself and they get this increased mucus production. So again, you can see here, this is a, a scope looking down a horse's trachea and we can see this stream of mucus here going up and down. Secondary to all of that, horses can get bronchospasm. So bronchospasm is essentially that the muscle around the airways of the horse constricts. So it kind of flexes and makes the, the airways themselves narrower. So those two things together cause airway obstruction. So we have that mucus in the middle, we have all those white blood cells kind of annoying everything. Then we get bronchoconstriction. And so now we go from you know, this nice open airway to this constricted airway that's much harder to get air through. Um, this is a picture of one of my colleagues, Dr. Pribble, it's her, her daughter. This picture is used with her permission. That's Josie demonstrating asthma for us. So what triggers all of that? So much like many things, it's, it's multifactorial. Um, so environment is far and away the biggest triggering factor, but there are certain things about certain horses that make them triggerable. So again, if we think about a barn that has 100 horses that all have the same environment, you know, not all of them have equine asthma. So there's something about the individual immune response in some horses that set them up for developing asthma when they're exposed to that environment. There is a genetic predisposition in certain family lines. We're still kind of learning more about that with ongoing research. And the question is always about infectious causes. You know, in people, if you have asthma and you get the flu, that often triggers, you know, worsening asthma in you. And so the, the role of infectious diseases in horses, so looking at equine influenza, um, as well as some of the other respiratory viruses and bacteria, the jury's still out. You know, there's still kind of ongoing research in terms of the exact role that infectious agents play in the development or exacerbation of asthma in horses. 
but kind of my conversation with people is always, you know, the, the healthier we can make the respiratory tract by having, you know, good vaccines and good biosecurity and good air quality, you know, the better that is going to be for any individual horse. Like I said, the environment is, is far and away our biggest issue in terms of triggering the clinical signs associated with asthma. And it all boils down to respirable particles. Um, so a respirable particle is something that is less than five micrometers. So it's very, very small. It's, you know, human hair, um, essentially, uh, and smaller to actually get into the lower airways of the horse where it can trigger that inflammation. And so this includes things like molds, fungi, pollen, endotoxin, which is a portion of bacteria. Um, plant fragments can all play a role in terms of being in the dust and in horses' environment. Ammonia can as well. So again, anyone who's ever been in a poorly ventilated barn with a lot of horse urine, you almost feel like it's burning your nostril hair. Uh, and it, it certainly can be irritating to horses' lungs. Smoke. Um, so again, unfortunately, when we have bad wildfire years, like we've had this year, and unfortunately, several of the past years on the West Coast, um, can, can trigger exacerbations of asthma as well. And then even horses near major roadways have been shown with exhaust fume exposure to have asthma as well. And then for any of you who are in the, the Southeastern United States, we can see this summer pasture associated severe equine asthma, which is triggered by subtropical grasses and their associated fungi. Um, you know, happily for any of you who are in that area, um, we're starting to come out of the worst season for summer pasture associated asthma. Uh, this in general is worst in most horses from about July to October. You know, as we start to get some cooler weather here, even in the, the Southeast, uh, we start to get this particular variant looking a little bit better. But again, the summer pasture associated is a severe equine asthma. And so we do know these horses, even though they might look great in February and March when the air is cooler, um, do still have abnormal lung function because they do have some of that remodeling within their airways. So in terms of diagnosis of equine asthma, um, you know, the severe ones, it can be pretty easy just looking at your horse, you know, sitting there struggling to breathe. Um, and having a cough and having what we call that heave line where they have that abdominal musculature uh, can, can all, you know, make us pretty confident that our horse has equine asthma. But it still is always good to, you know, work with your veterinarian to, to definitively diagnose it. You know, obviously, again, they're going to spend some time listening to the horse's chest with their stethoscope, um, both with and without a rebreathing bag. So again, if you've ever seen a veterinarian put a, a garbage bag over your horse's nose to make them take deep breaths, that's just trying to, again, make them take deep breaths so that we can hear their lungs a little bit better. Endoscopy uh, can also be quite helpful. So I showed a picture earlier of the, the mucus stream. And so again, looking for that mucus in the horse's airway can help us to make a diagnosis, but can also help us to rule out upper airway abnormalities. And especially again, for, for any of you who have some off-the-track thoroughbreds, you know, we know that so many of our thoroughbreds have um, left pharyngeal hemiplegia or have had a tie back surgery. Um, so again, making sure that that has not failed um, or maybe needed to be done in the first place and wasn't, and that's why the horse is coughing. All of those things are gonna help us to figure out you know, what the best course of action is for that individual horse. And then we may take a sample of those airway secretions to look at them under the microscope to really look at different cell types. Um, and, and to also, in some cases, rule out something like a pneumonia um, and make sure that we're treating the right thing. And so that would be where we would either do a, what we call a BAL or a tracheal aspirate, where we put some fluid in the lungs, take it back out, and then look at it under the microscope, where we look for certain white blood cell types, as well as some of this mucus and some other things. In general, x-rays and ultrasound for asthma are not horribly helpful. Again, they rule out some other things, but we don't expect them to be markedly abnormal with asthma. Blood work, again, usually normal. Never hurts to get a good baseline and make sure we're not missing something else in that horse. Um, but usually with asthma or uncomplicated asthma, we don't expect blood work to be abnormal. And then pulmonary function testing is something that is still done in some research institutions, but at this point in time is not being done in the field. So again, that was your kind of whirlwind review of equine asthma uh, in terms of the disease process. And now we will talk more about asthma treatment. So there's a three-part equine asthma treatment algorithm. Um, and so far and away, the most important thing for us to do 
is environmental modification. So everything that we can possibly think of to remove those dust particles and that particulate matter from the horse's environment is gonna be the most important. And I think, you know, this is true of so many of the diseases that we talk about in horses. You know, I know many of you have talked with about equine gastric ulcer syndrome. Um, you know, horses get ulcers for a variety of reasons. We can do a lot of things with drugs to, to try and heal them, but if we can't get them out of those stressful situations or we can't change their diet and make them eat more regularly, you know, then unfortunately we end up right back where we started. And equine asthma is kind of the same. Um, you know, it's not easy to, to affect the environment, but it's incredibly important to do so. On top of environmental change, uh, we can use drugs when we need to. And so the first drug or first drug class that we would use would be steroids. Um, steroids, glucocorticoids, corticosteroids, um, often kind of all those terms are used somewhat interchangeably, um, but steroids again are going to be very potent anti-inflammatories. And I mentioned earlier that the predominant process with equine asthma is inflammation. So we really need to break that inflammatory cycle with our glucocorticoids. And then in some cases, we may also use bronchodilators. So I mentioned bronchoconstriction, that is secondary to inflammation. So in general, at this point in time, both in people as well as in horses, you know, we say that use of bronchodilators alone in general is, is not going to be sufficient because we're, we're ignoring the primary issue, which is inflammation. But there are plenty of horses that will benefit from bronchodilation on top of a steroid or glucocorticoid. And I'll go through that in a little bit more detail. So again, the environmental modification, I really can't overemphasize how important it is. And again, I 100% recognize it is a pain in the butt, um, but it really does require consistency. And so I use this chart a lot, and I think I used it the last time that I talked with y'all about asthma, if you were there, but I think it does a nice job of pointing out how important environment is and how you need to stick with it. So this study on the, the y-axis here, we're looking at pulmonary resistance, which is a measure of lung function. Essentially, you can think of our goal as getting horses to one. A pulmonary resistance of less than one is, is normal. These horses all started at about three. So these were severely asthmatic horses. The open circles here were horses that got turned outside and were fed a complete pelleted feed. And you can see that this study lasted for a year. So this was a very intensive study. Um, but it took about six months of these horses living outside on a pelleted feed with no hay and no dust exposure to get to normal lung function. And so I point this out because again, I totally recognize that it's again, a pain to do all the environmental change. So a lot of times I'll talk to people who are like, well, you know, I did it for two weeks. I did it for a month and I didn't really see much of a difference. So why am I going to all of this headache to do it? You really need to stick with it. Um, because again, it, it's a slow but steady decline, but it can take about six months to, to really be effective. These little um, black triangles here were horses that got inhaled steroids. Uh, and you can see that, uh, I should back up. So they got inhaled steroids. The first six months, they were not allowed environmental change. So this first month, this horse received, or these horses received inhaled platicazone, but did not have environmental change. And you can see they got better. Um, but then they kind of plateaued. At the six month mark, they also got turned out and you can see they got better. And so again, to me, this really highlights nicely, you know, we can do all the environmental stuff, but while we're letting it have a chance to start making our horses look better, let's do some drug therapy. But if we can do both drug therapy and environmental change, we're gonna have the best outcome for our horses. So the environmental stuff, like I said, is, is not always easy, um, but consists of both management of feed as well as management of um, you know their stall and housing. So feed is a huge source of dust. And so in some cases, taking horses off of hay and going to complete pelleted feed may be important. Obviously for a lot of reasons, we don't like to do that forever. You know, horses like to eat hay. Uh, it's good for their GI tract. It's good for their mental stimulation and keeping them out of trouble. So many of them, we do try and get them back on some degree of hay. So we may advise that you soak the hay for in general, at least half an hour. Um, there's a lot of hay steamers out there now um, that can do a good job. And in some cases, even feeding haylage, which is essentially almost a, a fermented form of hay, can be really effective in terms of dust. We just have to be very, very careful with how that's managed. Um, otherwise we can set horses up for botulism. 
feeding hay on the ground is very important. Um, so uh, elevated hay nets, horses inhale a lot more dust when eating on an elevated hay net or a hay rack of any variety versus if their head is down and they're feeding um, or eating their hay off the ground, then again, gravity is kind of in your favor and they're not gonna inhale as much dust. And then avoiding round bales, uh, which again, I recognize for economics as well as um, availability are sometimes all you have. Uh, but I always advise, you know, kind of try and keep the round bale outside of the horse's turnout, you know, put it in a shed or something like that and just pitchfork chunks of hay off of it to, to feed the horse. Avoid straw in stalls. Straw is a huge source of dust. Um, so using any sort of, you know, shaving or wood pellet, uh, paper, cardboard, even just plain black rubber mats can be useful. Don't have horses inside while you're cleaning stalls or cleaning barn aisles uh, because that kicks up a ton of dust and then don't store hay or straw above the stalls. So like I said, when you're doing all of those things, but the horse needs more, then the first course or the first class of drugs that we're gonna reach for are gonna be our steroids or our glucocorticoids. And so steroids reduce inflammation. So they're incredibly potent anti-inflammatories. Historically, there have been a lot of ways to give steroids to horses. So we can give them orally, we could give them via injection, whether that was into the vein or into the muscle. Um, or we could use some different products and try and give them via inhalation. Systemic steroids, again, could be oral, IV, or IM. Um, in general here, we're talking about dexamethasone and prednisolone and occasionally triamcinolone. I think you know, those are gonna be the steroids that have most commonly been used in a systemic fashion. The, the pros or the benefits of systemic steroids are that they're cheap and easy and everyone loves cheap and easy. Um, you know, again, pretty much any horse, hopefully with, you know, some basic horsemanship, uh, you can either get something into them orally or, you know, stick a needle in them and, and get it in them that way. So again, it's something that most people could do at home. Um, and again, most of these drugs are, are reasonably inexpensive. The downside to systemic steroid administration is that we're exposing the entire body. So again, we're trying to treat the horse's lungs but we're exposing their entire system to whatever drug that it is that we're giving. And so the way that we measure that is something called cortisol suppression. So essentially what cortisol suppression tells us is that when we're giving a steroid, so let's say we're giving dexamethasone to a horse, if, if we take a blood sample and that horse's cortisol is now low, it's because their body is recognizing the dexamethasone that we're giving and confusing it. And it's essentially messing up its endocrine access so that it's not producing its own cortisol anymore. So when we talk about any sort of steroid, if we are giving a steroid to a horse, cortisol suppression is a bad thing. It's an, it's an adverse effect. And it, we use it as a marker to say, how likely is it for that horse to develop other adverse effects associated with those steroids? So again, with steroids, we suppress their immune system. Um, I think our biggest fear with steroids in horses is certainly laminitis or founder. Um, and then we can also cause Cushing's disease in horses by giving them enough steroids. And so not surprisingly, when we give systemic dexamethasone or prednisolone, again, we're exposing their entire body to it. And so we are causing cortisol suppression and that is shown here in this chart. Um, so this is IV dexamethasone and oral prednisolone, um, day zero, and then uh, with one week of treatment. And um, you can see marked suppression with both drugs. Uh, so again, we are affecting their own endocrine access when we give systemic dexamethasone or prednisolone. So because of that, kind of the, the holy grail or the gold standard has always been to, to try and deliver steroids via inhalation. You know, with our thought process being, if we're giving the drug directly to the lungs, that we can hopefully give a lower dose, um, as well as then have a less risk of side effects. Um, so we figure that we're, we're targeting it right where we need it, um, and hopefully protecting the horse from the rest of it. The, the downsides to our inhalant corticosteroids or uh, glucocorticoids that we've had are that they're expensive. Um, the other problem with them is there's not a ton of research behind all of their use uh, because we're either using a human product, um, so a, a pressurized meter dose inhaler, 
and trying to essentially fit that into a horse, um, or we're using a nebulizer and dissolving solutions in a nebulizer and delivering them to the horse that way. Um, but if we think about what a nebulizer does, you know, how much drug gets delivered to the lower airway with a nebulizer depends on both the technology behind the nebulizer itself, as well as the exact solution that you're putting in there, as well as if you're diluting it with anything. And so, you know, there's just, again, not a ton of research of every drug combination that you can run through a nebulizer to say how much of it is reaching the correct particle size, as well as how much of it is actually reaching the lower airways. And with the inhalant steroids that have been out there, which again, would either be the use of a human uh, MDI um, or the use of a nebulizer, both of those scenarios, the best numbers that have ever been shown is less than 20% of that drug is delivered to the lower airway. The other downside to these are that there are multiple studies showing that they do both also cause cortisol suppression. So again, we were all doing the best that we could with the limitations of what we had and thinking, okay, well, we're giving lower doses to the lungs. So hopefully they're not actually taking this up and, and exposing their entire body to steroids, but both inhaled fluticasone as well as nebulized dexamethasone um, and budesonide and beclomethasone have all been shown to still cause cortisol suppression. So even though we were doing the best we could, um, we unfortunately still had systemic exposure. Um, and so, like I said, our, our options there were the use of various spacers here, like the aerohippus with something like fluticasone, or again, the, the use of a nebulizer with a variety of different drugs. But again, I commend people for doing the best they could, um, but not a ton to, to justify their use, unfortunately. And this study actually came out of um, the group up in Montreal, does probably the, honestly, the bulk of the equine respiratory research in the world at this point. Um, and they actually specifically looked at nebulization of dexamethasone and showed that giving the same amount of dexamethasone orally as running it through a nebulizer, it was actually more effective in terms of the horse's clinical signs when giving it orally, but both means of administration. So again, whether we gave it orally or whether we gave it via nebulization, both still caused that cortisol suppression. Uh, so kind of their take home was, you know what, you're, you're still getting that systemic exposure. So you may as well actually just give the dexamethasone orally um, because you're actually having a little bit more of a clinical effect from it. So that's why we're super excited to tell you about this new product that we have, which is called the Acervo Equihaler, uh, which is the Clestinide Inhalation Spray. And so for anyone who knows anything about the FDA approval process, it is a long and winding road. Um, so this is a product that was about 10 years in the making, but is the first FDA approved inhaled steroid for use in the horse. So again, everything that we've kind of been talking about and, and using until now in horses was the best that we had at the time, um, but none of it was really specifically designed for use in horses um, or specifically validated for use in horses. And, and this product now is, and, and like I said, it's been a long time in the making. And we're gonna talk about two aspects of it. So one is the drug that's within it itself, which is a drug called seclesonide, which is a steroid. It's a pretty cool drug. We'll talk about that in a second. And then we will also talk about the soft mist inhaler technology, uh, which is actually from the, the human market. Um, so that the human Respimat inhaler uh, involves soft mist inhalation. We've extrapolated its use to horses and again, validated it specifically for asthmatic horses. So we'll talk about both of those two things. So we're gonna start with seclesonide itself. So again, seclesonide is a steroid or a glucocorticoid, but it's a very cool class of glucocorticoids. So it's something that's called a prodrug. So a prodrug is a drug that has little or no pharmacological activity in kind of its base form, but then it gets activated at the target tissue, which will reduce unintended effects of the drug. So seclesonide is what is is the drug that's actually in the acervo equihaler itself. Again, I'll show you some pictures of it and whatnot here, and we'll actually go live for a minute, and I'll show you a whole little demo of it. Uh, but seclesonide, which is the drug itself, is reasonably inactive. When it reaches the horse's airway epithelium, so when the horse actually inhales it, the seclesonide gets activated to desseclesonide, which is the actual active form. Um, and so again, it is very well localized to the lung tissue. So again, this would be our little drug seclesonide that the horses inhaled. This is um, obviously 
obviously it's a drawing, um, but this would be the horse's lung tissue. So the seclesonide gets taken up by the lung tissue. It meets this certain enzyme that is within the pulmonary tissue, which activates it, it kind of cuts it into desseclesonide, and that it is that desseclesonide that actually finds the receptor uh, and has all of the anti-inflammatory effects. So that's one huge benefit of this drug is that, again, it truly is targeted to the lung tissue because it is only activated within the lung tissue. The other benefit of this drug is something that's called its receptor affinity. So this is an, ex an expression of the potency of a steroid. Um, so it's essentially a marker for how well it binds to that glucocorticoid or steroid receptor. Um, which is again, a, a marker of its anti-inflammatory effect. So if we take dexamethasone, which I think is probably again, the steroid most people are most comfortable with and say that dexamethasone has this RRA or receptor affinity of 100, desiclesonide, so the active form of our drug has a 12 times greater affinity for that steroid receptor. Um, so again, it's 12 times more potent than dexamethasone. Flip side of that, seclesonide, the base drug is really quite inactive. So again, if the horse happened to, to swallow the seclesonide instead of inhaling it and it ending up in the, the horse's lower airways, if it just swallowed that seclesonide before it got activated, it really wouldn't do anything um, because it is not very potent. Um, so again, the combination of those two things really gives us a, a great safety uh, profile on this particular drug. And again, I'll show you some brief um, information on that. But again, the, the drug itself really stays very well localized in terms of its activity to the lung itself. So that's a little bit about the drug. And then this is the, the soft mist inhalant technology that is used to deliver the drug. So if anyone has not seen the Acervo Equihaler yet, here you go. Um, here's some video graphics of it, but again, we'll go through some of the, the bits and pieces of it. So the first thing is the actual soft mist inhalant technology itself. And, I show this picture, not because I'm an engineer, because I'm a veterinarian, I'm far from an engineer, um, but I like to point out two things about it. So one is that the, the power jet used to generate the mist is done by a mechanical spring. So again, for any of you who have used either in your horse, yourself, your child, a flaticazone puffer or any of the other human-based um, pressurized meter dose inhalers, those all have what we call a chemical propellant used to, to generate the mist. Those chemical propellants have significant greenhouse gas emissions. So that's why many of them have either A, gone off the market or become very expensive is partially because of their environmental impacts versus ours is entirely mechanically derived. So we don't have that gas emission. So the spring generates the power, which essentially drives the fluid through this uniblock which makes these two little jets of fluid that hit each other at just the right angle to generate this mist that has some properties that we'll talk about here in a second. But I also show this picture because one of the things we will talk about with the Acervo Equihaler is that it is designed for use in a single horse for the 10 day course of treatment. We can't change out the drug cartridge in the bottom. That's a super common question. Um, and part of why we can't do that is the intricacy of this technology. So essentially, you know, trying to change out this drug cartridge um, would make that make it to where these things don't line up and don't have that accuracy to, to make that mist anymore. Um, and so equine veterinarians and horse owners, uh, we're all very guilty of trying to MacGyver everything to, to suit our needs. So I partially show this picture to discourage anyone from trying to take the whole thing apart and, and rig it in some way, um, because it really, you just, you can't do it, unfortunately. So the good parts about it though, are that again, it generates this very fine mist um, with a high fine particle fraction and an appropriate speed to really maximize delivery to the horse's lower airways. I already mentioned again, it doesn't have a chemical propellant. It has that spring and it's accurate. So that's one of the other downsides to again, everything that we've used so far to, to try and treat a horse with inhalant steroids are that again, we were doing the best we could but none of those things were validated in terms of, you know, each dose delivering the exact same amount of drug that the horse could inhale. Um, so every puff, so to speak, or every breath was going to be different. 
versus with this product, we know that every single puff that comes out of the acervo equihaler has 343 micrograms of sequestinide. Um, so we have that good accuracy. And then there's an ethanolic solution in there as a preservative. So the first thing we'll talk about is again, this high fine particle fraction. So I mentioned earlier uh, when we talked about things that trigger equine asthma in the horse. So those dust particles, if they are less than five micrometers, they can reach the lower airway to trigger asthma. The same is true of drugs. Um, so, you know, we, we don't want dust to reach the lower airways, but we do want our drugs to reach the lower airways. And so we want drug particles that are less than five micrometers uh, to know that they have that opportunity to again, reach those lower airways. And with the soft mist inhaler and with seclastinide, we know that greater than 90% of the particles that we are generating are of that appropriate size to, to reach the lower airways versus again, we just don't have that information on all of the other combinations of drugs out there. We also have what we call a, a low velocity, long duration um, stream. So again, you can see here, this is the, the soft mist inhaler with the, the nostril adapter taken off. But you can see it's about a one second duration. Again, for any of you who have used a, an MDI, um, again, either yourself or in a horse, you know, it has that kind of short, sharp burst, which has actually been shown to end up lodging some of the drug in the back of your throat uh, versus with this longer duration, it does actually increase deep lung deposition. And it specifically has been validated and timed for use in asthmatic horses. I already mentioned again, the, the dosing accuracy. So again, that's part of the FDA approval process as we have to show this. Um, I've mentioned again that it is propellant free. So again, we don't have that greenhouse gas emission. You know, one of the common questions is, okay, so we can't change out that drug cartridge. So you're telling me that, you know, at the end of 10 days, I have to throw this whole thing away. Um, you know, unfortunately at this point, yes, I will tell you BI is very committed to, to the environment. And we know that with that mechanical spring, we actually have less of a carbon footprint than we would with a chemical propellant. Um, and the, the actual unit itself is made with recycled plastic. So again, we're, we're conscious of the environmental impact and, and we're doing what we can about it. And then like I said, there is also this ethanolic solution that's within the drug itself um, to decrease the potential for microbial contamination. But honestly, one of the other kind of unintended good parts about this drug being, or this device, you know, being designed for use in a single horse for that 10 day treatment protocol is that you're not taking that same thing going down the shed row and so shoving that same thing up 10 different horses nostrils or that mask that you're putting over a horse and having a bunch of different horses breathe in and out of it. Um, where again, you don't know if that horse has a respiratory virus, you know, he's now spread it. Um, so again, the, the biosecurity aspect of having a, a unit per horse also I think is, is something that's kind of an, an unintended but beneficial effect. So this is the Acervo Equihaler itself. So I'm gonna go through the parts here and then I will actually turn my video on and show you one for a minute. Uh, but this is the nostril adapter. It is designed for use in the left nostril only. So again, a lot of time was actually spent making the exact right size and curve and diameter of this to, to fit snugly within the nostril. So if for some reason your horse doesn't have a left nostril, this is not the product for your horse, um, but it will always go into the left nostril. We also get the question, you know, should I be alternating? Nope, left nostril only. Uh, there's this little breath indicator so that we can time drug delivery, ideally to inspiration, which again, I'll show you in live action in a second. And then again, we'll go through the, the parts of the handle and whatnot when I show you live. Uh, in terms of storage, it's kind of typical of most drugs, you know, keep it reasonably temperature controlled. So keep it, you know, in your house or in your tack room, you know, while you're storing it. When you take it out to the barn to treat the horse, if it's greater than a hundred or if it's freezing cold that day in your barn, it's fine to have it out there for the course of treatment. Um, so for the, you know, 10, 15 minutes that it might take for you to get it in the horse, but in between try and uh, keep it again, somewhere temperature controlled. And like I said, the, the, um, label dosage is a 10 day course of treatment. Each unit should be used within 12 days of activation. So essentially once you activate a unit, which I'll show you, um, you wanna use it within 12 days. So again, this is the treatment duration um, and it is one size fits all. 
so again, this is one of the other kind of nice things about this drug is you don't have to sit there and, you know, get out your weight tape and figure out, you know, a, a dose per weight sort of a dosage. Um, essentially, if the nostril adapter fits in your horse's nostril, um, it's going to get the same treatment. And again, recognize that this is for management of clinical signs. So as I mentioned earlier, if you have that horse that is severely, severely affected, I think we all recognize we're not going to cure disease in 10 days. Um, but we can certainly make that horse feel better and give us an opportunity to change the environment uh, and do some other things. And so it's a bit of a tapering dose. So for the first five days, they get eight puffs twice a day. And then for the second five days, they get 12 puffs once a day. And so again, you can see here, so again, this is Dr. Pribble, whose daughter you all saw earlier, um, treating one of her own horses in the barn. Um, but here comes the part you get to see my smiling face because I'm gonna go on video here for a second. Stop sharing. I'm gonna turn on my video. Hello all. I also, I wore my makeover 5K shirt just for the occasion. So I'm not just wearing a t-shirt because I didn't feel like dressing up. This is my dressing up. I'm supporting the uh, makeover 5K. All right, so this is the Acervo Equihaler. Um, Again, we can see this blue piece up here is the nostril adapter. Again, that is curved for use in the left nostril. This here is a little silicone membrane that's called the breath indicator. Um, again, that we can use to best time when we're delivering drug to our horses. Cause again, we ideally wanna give it kind of right as they're inhaling. Um, but as I'll show you, if your timing is not great, it's okay. Then we have the handle piece. This is the air intake. So you just don't want to hold a hand over there or you'd interfere with its ability to actually generate air. And then we have the, the handle and the dosing lever. And then this here is the actual drug canister. And you can see it has what's called a fill indicator here. Um, so again, for anyone who has used a fluticasone puffer, you know, it keeps count of how many puffs you've given. This is a little bit more of a rough indication. So it starts off at 190. 90 to 80, 80 to 70. So it's approximating how much you have left within a, a cartridge itself. So that is the whole uh, equihaler itself. Um, again, I'm gonna go through some of this, just I'm gonna take advantage of the fact that I have you as my audience, uh, because there are a couple little kind of tips and tricks to this thing. And so again, some of you maybe have already used it, maybe you're considering its use, um, maybe someone else in your barn has one and you can help them with it. So the first time you get an acervo equihaler, what you have to do are two steps that are called activation and priming. And then after that, each time you go to treat your horse, it's simple and you just treat your horse. So the very first step when you get an equihaler is activation, which is essentially piercing this drug canister with the little piercing element that's here in the handle. So then it would be able to draw a drug up. So to do that, we just hold here and we just push this all the way in. So you'll hear a little click there, but you wanna push until it's all the way in. So you can see it takes a little bit of effort. Um, you know, for some people it may be easier even to use the, you know, use a table or a hard surface, um, but you just wanna make sure that you no longer can see the drug canister at all. So now I have pierced this drug canister with the piercing element that's in here. Then I need to prime it. So essentially, again, I've got, you know, my drug here, I've got a little kind of needle here that's drawing drug out. So I'm gonna prime the system. So I'm gonna pull a couple doses in. So then when I go to treat my horse, I know that I'm delivering drug. So to prime, we do three puffs or three actuations and each puff is a two-step process. I know this sounds a little bit complicated, but once you have one in your hand, it's really not that bad. So when we do a full pull, that's actually loading that mechanical spring. And then you do just a tiny pull and that actually would deliver drugs. We do that three times. So that was once, full pull, half pull, that was twice, full pull, half pull, that was three times. Now essentially my system is primed. So I would be ready to go ahead and treat the horse. And I'm gonna get it up close and personal here and hopefully some of you can see. So that full pull, I loaded the spring. And now my little pull, you can actually see that mist coming out. Um, so again, this would now be ready to, to treat a horse. Obviously, I am currently in my home office, not in the barn, but I have my little friend Pinocchio here. 
Yeah, these are the things that you figure out how to do when you're, you know, in a whole new virtual world. Um, so this is my little demonstration unit. I think, you know, people always have questions. Again, you know, how is my horse going to actually tolerate having this up his schnoz? Most horses actually do quite well. Um, so in all of our studies, 93% of horses accepted the use of the acerbo equihaler. Now, obviously, some take a little bit more desensitization than others. You know, there are those horses that legitimately owners tell me they can walk up to the horse in the field without a halter, you know, kind of just grab him, treat him, and he never reacts. I would say there are going to be other ones that especially initially might take a little bit more restraint and a little bit more kind of coaching and training, you know, even just doing some desensitization by kind of rubbing it around them, clicking it next to them, giving them some treats. All of those things can be beneficial. And then like I said, it is for left nostril use only. So you would hold the unit in your left hand. So your right hand would be free to, you know, I don't have a halter on Pinocchio. He's, he's a good boy. Um, so you could hold the halter, you could hold his nose, you know, whatever is easiest for you. And then I like to do, it's called the chicken wing technique. So if you have your elbow up and start to insert the unit and then twist down, that's gonna really make that best seal within their nostril. And then I would be ready to dose my horse. And so again, you would do a full pull to load the spring. And then again, if you remember, it's that little baby pull or half pull that actually discharges drug. And that's when you could sit here and watch this little breath indicator as the breath indicator starts to move in, that means the horse is inhaling, I could deliver my little puff and that horse has now been treated. Um, and so again, it would be eight puffs twice a day for five days and then 12 puffs once a day for five days. So again, I kind of just wanted to run through some of that because I think some of it it's easier to show than it is to, to even describe. Um, but I will also say that again, if any of you either already have or become interested in this as a potential treatment for your horse. Um, this is the box that it comes in. On the box itself, there is this scannable QR code uh, that it, when you scan that code, it takes you to a whole user instruction video, um, as well as a little user handbook and all sorts of other things in there. So we've tried to provide you know, a lot of resources um, on the how-to um, as much as about the actual drug itself. Okay, I'm gonna turn my video off again so you don't have to look at me. And it goes back to sharing my screen. So that was a little bit about the how-to. So obviously, again, to, to get approval, we did have to show that it worked. <laughs> I think that's that's probably, maybe I should have started with that. The product is effective. Um, so the acervo equihalers um, was shown to be effective in improving clinical signs of severe equine asthma. So we did that based upon something called a weighted clinical score. So that's a combination of cough, nasal discharge, um, horses respiratory rate and effort, et cetera, and showed that horses that received the equihaler um, improved by 5.3 points in that 10-day period. I mentioned earlier, 93% of horses accepted its use. Um, so really, like I said, despite the fact that it looks maybe a little intimidating, um, horses are sometimes smarter than we give them credit for and also realize things that make them feel better. So again, some of them, while they may have been a little bit naughty on day one, kind of realized, hey, I can breathe better after this happens, so I'm gonna tolerate it. And then we did also look at horses for up to 100 days of continuous use. So again, each one is designed for 10 days, uh, but there were some horses that we kept on it for 10 sequential treatments, so 100 total days, um, and it was safe uh, in terms of no adverse effects seen. So again, getting to the safety, um, we looked at it um, again in that field study, so looking at 100 days. We also looked at, at, at three times the dose and three times the duration and showed that even at three times the label dose, uh, there were no statistically significant changes to serum cortisol. So again, that's one of the things I've mentioned with all of the other products that we are currently using from a steroid standpoint to, to treat horses' asthma. Every single one of them, no matter how we're administering it, has been shown to cause cortisol suppression. Um, this is the first product that does not. Um, and so we're super excited about that. Again, in terms of really feeling good that we are targeting this drug to their lungs and not affecting the rest of their body. Uh, no other changes in their blood values in terms of their white blood cell count or their serum chemistry. And every treatment group had a little bit of mild nasal discharge, but that included the placebo group or the control group. Um, and again, obviously these horses all had asthma um, and we were shoving something up their nose. 
So that's your quick intro to the Acervo Equihaler. I'm just gonna say a couple more things about treatment and then we'll take questions. Um, so step three of the treatment algorithm is bronchodilation. Um, and so, like I said, you know, we need to address the inflammation with steroids, but in plenty of cases, horses may also need some bronchodilation. Um, so when we're doing that, we're talking about either um, systemic administration, so systemic clenbuterol or ventipulmin, or we can use inhaled bronchodilators like inhaled albuterol um, as well. With systemic clenbuterol, you know, it's easy, so we're giving it orally. May also have some other beneficial effects in, in terms of improving mucociliary clearance. And again, may let us use a lower steroid dose, but again, won't fully replace steroids. You know, the downsides to our systemic bronchodilators are occasionally cost and availability. Um, again, oral clenbuterol is good. Um, oral albuterol is not um, going to be absorbed by the horse. So we need to pay attention to exactly what we're giving horses. And then historically with some of the different systemic bronchodilators, um, they may cause excitement if the horse got overdosed by accident. Um, and then we also get something that's called tachyphylaxis, uh, which is essentially that horses at some point stop responding to the drug. So their receptors downregulate and they no longer will respond. Like I said, inhaled, or I'm sorry, inhaled bronchodilators. So again, things like inhaled albuterol, kind of like we've talked about all along in terms of inhalation, you know, we're delivering drug to the site, which is something we're super excited about. Um, and in some cases, this may be important from a rescue standpoint. So the horse that is in severe, severe distress, you know, this may be the thing that kind of makes them feel better quicker while we get steroids on board. The downside, again, obviously to any sort of inhalation is that we still require some sort of an administration device. Um, and again, when we're talking about albuterol, we can only give it via inhalation, it's not orally bioavailable. What about non-steroidals? So non-steroidals, so things like butanbanamine are ineffective uh, in terms of asthma. You know, great for plenty of other things in horses, uh, but are not potent enough to affect their lungs. Antihistamines also really have minimal to no efficacy in horses with true severe equine asthma. Um, and so again, you know, there are some horses that anecdotally might respond in terms of, you know, coughing or nasal discharge to antihistamines. In general, um, that's because we're treating something different than true asthma. You know, asthma within horses is, uh, without going too far down a rabbit hole, um, is in general not very histamine mediated. Immunotherapy, so this would be hyposensitization. Um, in general, hasn't in a research standpoint been shown to be of much benefit. You know, the serum testing and subsequent treatment, no benefit has ever been shown. Um, intradermal skin testing and associated treatment, in general, not helpful for asthma, maybe helpful certainly for some skin conditions and some other things. You know, the one thing that's out there um, in addition to, to steroids and bronchodilators that may be of some benefit though is omega fatty acids. Um, people often ask about supplements, no matter what disease we're talking about in horses. Um, and there is some work that omega uh, fatty acids may be of some benefit along with environmental change and other things in horses with equine asthma. So essentially in summary, you know, asthma, there's a spectrum of clinical signs from those mild to moderate all the way through to the severe. Again, if we can catch them and do some of the environmental change and whatnot early, then hopefully we're catching them before they start to have that lung remodeling. Um, if we're only treating them now that they've had severe equine asthma, you know, we need to be reasonable with our goals because they may have some of that remodeling that's just gonna be hard to reverse. Again, management is far and away gonna be the most important and then use drugs when needed. And then like I said, you know, we're, we're pretty excited about this Acervo Equihaler just because again, it is FDA approved. So we have proven safety and efficacy and consistent dosing. And we know that it's making it to the lower airways of horses. Um, and so again, we're, we're pretty excited to, to have it out there. And, and again, it's only been available for I guess about six weeks now. It was the middle of September that we finally got it launched. So we're, we're still getting stories back from people every day. Um, and, and so far it's, it's been really nice to hear, um, you know, how, how beneficial it has been for a lot of horses and, and their owners. But again, the bottom line is much like everything. I feel like broken record here, uh, but really try and control environment as much as you can. And so with that, I will take any questions.
Well, we did have one question that was submitted earlier today um, by someone who wasn't going to be able to watch live, uh, but still wanted to make sure that she got her question answered. So that was good that she sent it in early. Um, so her question is, what is the comparison of the new inhaler device to the currently, avail currently available nebulizer? I use the Flexineb currently on my horse, and I'm very interested to hear what advantages the new inhaler might have. My horse gets both albuterol and Beautiful. Yes, the nod. Okay, what you said. <laughs> uh, with the nebulizer before workouts. So I know you touched on this a little bit when you were going over the inhaler, but definitely um, curious how you yeah. answered that question. Yeah, it's a great question and one that we're getting from a lot of people because certainly Flexineb, probably over about the last five years now, you know, has really taken off in the U.S. market. And I think, you know, I don't want to say that there are no applications for it because I think that there are. I think. Like I mentioned earlier, I think the hardest thing, especially from a comparison aspect, is that when we talk about nebulizing drugs, we can say whatever about the actual nebulizer itself, but how effective it is at actually, again, generating that particle size, making those particles be less than five micrometers, and then having them in a format in which the horse can actually inhale them as opposed to swallow them, depends on both the nebulizer as well as the exact solution that's being put into it. And so there's just not good consistent research behind any of those. You know, I know that there's a variety of different dosage protocols out there, which are kind of just, I don't want to say winging it, but a little bit, um, because again, it's kind of extrapolating, you know, some different drug doses to different things and not always, you know, being consistent with, like I said, if they're being diluted or the, you know, time period over which they're being nebulized and whatnot. So I think, especially from a steroid standpoint, um, the, the benefit really of the acervoacuahiller is that dosing consistency and knowing exactly what we're giving the horse and that it's able, again, to be the appropriate size and be inhaled into the lower airways. Um, you know, like I said, it is only the seclesonide. You know, we can't change out the, the drug cartridge in there and put other things in there. And so kind of what I'm telling a lot of people, if they want to try the acervoacuahiller is great. If you have already invested in a Flexineb, I'm, I'm not going to tell you, you know, don't use it for anything. Um, you know, if your horse is one that does do better with some bronchodilators as well, great. You know, let's use the Flexineb for, for the albuterol portion, but then let's replace, you know, the steroids with the, the safer steroid, which is the seclesonide and the acerboequahaler. So just to clarify, and I do not use a nebulizer myself, but I know some people are able to use them almost like a maintenance um, before athletic activity. So would the equihaler be used specifically to treat like acute asthma? Yeah, so that's a, that is a great question when we're getting a lot of, so again, the, the FDA approved label for the acervo equihaler is for the management of clinical signs associated with severe equine asthma. So again, these are horses that have clinical signs at rest. We know that people are people are going to and already are using it in an, some different dosage protocols um, for kind of more of this maintenance type thing or kind of some pre-work things and whatnot. It's something, it's the benefit and the curse of being FDA approved is that we can't really comment on those. Um, we look forward to hearing from veterinarians that do start doing some of those different protocols in horses and their response to it. But as a company, we have to stick by what we have on our FDA label, uh, which is that 10 day course of treatment for severe equine asthma. Good, good to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, so things I never even knew really before I worked at, you know, for pharmaceutical companies or either is, you know, again, it's the good and the bad of FDA approval. Right. Yeah, that makes sense that, you know, you have to follow certain rules. <laughs> well, and I think one of the, you know, one of the reasons that it is that way, because we get that question a lot, you know, if we even just look at, you know, the, you know, rationale behind why is it only labeled for use in severe equine asthma, is that severe equine asthma is reasonably easy to diagnose and to monitor response to treatment. When we start talking about those mild to moderate equine asthma cases, especially those truly mild, you know, that are just performance related, there's not an easy objective measurement that we can do to say, you know, after however many days of treatment, this horse got better. Um, and so to, again, do that, run statistics on it and submit it, so to speak, there's almost, there are very limited ways to, to do that, uh, which is partially why it's not on the label. 
So we've gotten a couple of comments and a question. So I'll start with the question. Um, my horse has had asthma for two years, started with a severe situation and treated with nebulizer, et cetera. Um, changed his environment drastically, so I think that is pretty well managed. My question is that his asthma is much worse in summer and has improved around this time of year. Would we see benefits of using the equihaler now, even though he's doing much better? Um, she's specifically trying to think, of, thinking of trying to prevent more lung remodeling. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, my theory has always been, or kind of my approach to so many diseases and horses is to, to kind of target my use of drugs for when I need them. Um, but being a little bit proactive. So I would say in your horse, you know, if you feel like clinically he's doing spectacular this time of year, when the weather is better for him, then I'd almost say, okay, you know, keep doing what you're doing there. It sounds like, you know, your horse very well in terms of kind of what time of year he starts to get bad. And so that's where I kind of just, you know, mark on my calendar, set myself a little phone reminder, you know, when I'm starting to get close to that time of year to then kind of have drug on hand and start then preventatively using or kind of that the first day that horse coughs, the first day he starts to have a little bit of an increased respiratory rate and effort, jump on top of it then. Um, but, you know, in terms of the evidence of, you know, being able to reverse remodeling with long-term steroid use, to me, at least there's enough of a cost benefit analysis there that I'm not a huge, huge proponent of it. Thanks. Um, so some of the comments we've gotten, um, Joseph comments that he used the servo equihaler when it first came out. It knocked out the severe cough my horse had. Now she has a higher breath rate, but seems to be okay. Just trying to manage it and use the arbuterol. We think it was set off by allergies. We're located in Aiken, South Carolina, and it has been a bad year. Yeah, yeah, certainly if you're in Aiken, you know, you are in that kind of pasture associated where it is, you know, that late summer, early fall is a hard time of year to manage those horses. Um, so I think it's great, you know, if you're kind of able to get rid of the worst of the clinical signs and then, yeah, you kind of figure out what works for your horse than other times of year. Um, you know, hot days, we do know are a challenge for horses. Um, you know, we've um, some, some groups, so like I, I mentioned earlier, the group in Montreal does a ton of equine respiratory work, you know, and they've even looked at pulmonary function and it, how it changes with, with ambient temperatures uh, because they had even noticed in horses that weren't overtly, you know, coughing up a lung, but would notice that their respiratory rate would go up in hot times of year. And we're trying to figure out, you know, is that that the horse's respiratory rate is going up because he's just trying to cool himself um, or is it actually worsening of lung function? And it is actually worsening of lung function. So whether that's again, because it's triggering other pollens and just other things in the air, um, but that the, the Southeast is tough. You know, I, I practiced in Florida for close to 10 years and it is tough. And that tie in with the South, is that just due to humidity and pollens? Like what is it specifically yeah. about that region? It's kind of the double whammy of you get that heat and humidity and then it does appear to be some of the tropical grasses um, with some of the associated fungi that grow on them specific to the Southeast. But we will see it in other areas of the country. So again, I mean, even in you know Phoenix, clearly not humid, um, you get some really hot days and that can trigger some horses there. Um, in the United Kingdom, again, where I think of the climate of the United Kingdom is rather different than the climate of, you know, Florida and Alabama, uh, you know, they can get this kind of summer pasture associated too, where again, it appears to be related to heat. So I think the Southeast really, I think gets the double, like I said, the double whammy of heat as well as pollen and grasses. Other areas, even just with heat alone can have some issues. The plus side being they can ride in the winter, so. There is that. <laughs> Uh, we have a comment on Facebook from Katie who says, I got to see your presentation at Piedmont Equine Clinic last year and stumbled across this webinar. Great info and updates on the drugs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would so love my we, time in Virginia. Yes. I think I've driven past that once, uh, but I live in New York. <laughs> so like I said, we have a question right now. So I'm, I'm not in Virginia currently, but I always <laughs> spend my time at Piedmont. Uh, if you have any other questions, now is the time to ask them. Um, if you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube on replay, um, we will try to keep track of questions probably for about a week after um, this webinar. And um, if there are questions that Dr. Roos can answer, then we'll definitely send those on to her. 
Um, after about a week, unfortunately, this will sort of go down our newsfeed a little bit. We won't be able to keep track quite the same way. But um, if you've got a burning question, you can also email it to info at the rrp.org and that will get to our inbox and we'll make sure we get that forwarded on to Dr. Sarah. Um, yeah, and I think it is just something I said, you know, certainly reach out to your veterinarians as well. Like I said, you know, we've been trying as much as we can to kind of spread the word about this particular drug and product to, to horse owners, veterinarians, veterinary technicians, everybody. So, you know, if it is something that anything I said kind of piques your interest and it's something you're interested in trying, you know, certainly reach out to your own veterinarian as well about, you know, how appropriate it is for your particular horse. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Dr. Roos. Um, uh, definitely sounds like a game changer. So hopefully We're good things. Excited. It's been it's been fun. Me and me and Pinocchio in our <laughs> Zoom road show have uh, have been busy, but again, it is it's it's something we're pretty excited to have out there, and it's a pretty cool product. So we look forward to hearing more about it, and hopefully soon we will all be able to see each other again in person and hang out in Lexington at the horse park next October. Yeah, we'd love to see you, and yeah, hopefully we'll all get together in person. We had one question just snuck in under the wire. Um, how long is the drug shelf life unopened and then after opening? Yep. So unopened, it's a two-year shelf life. Um, once it has been activated, so again, once we've pierced that cartridge, um, it should be used within 12 days. All right. Good question. Good question. Yeah. All right. If there's no other questions, and I think we will call that a night, but thanks to everybody who's joined us live. Um, and if you're watching on replay, definitely feel free to leave some questions in the comments or send them to us at info at the rrp.org. Thanks, Dr. Roos. Thank you for having me. Have a Take good night. Care, everybody.